uh, teaching post-war British history through the history of education. Uh, we, we've, uh, we're delighted to have today uh, some colleagues from the, the Cambridge Secondary Education and Social Change in the UK uh, project, uh, Annie Thwaites, uh, Andrew Stacey, and Chris Jepson. And so I'll pass over, first of all, is it to, to Chris? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about our research and especially um, about the, the ongoing collaboration uh, with four secondary school teachers uh, through which we're, we're trying to turn some of our archival research into um, key stage three learning resources aimed to help with the teaching of post-war British history in secondary schools. Um, I'm Chris Jefferson, as, as Gary said, I'm a postdoc on the project and I'm speaking today with Annie Thwaite, who is our public engagement coordinator. And we're really fortunate and incredibly grateful to have one of our teachers, uh, Andrew Stacey Chapman, with us as well, who is uh, Head of History at North Allison School in North Yorks. Um, we're also representing our wider project team uh, on, our, on the ESSC funded project. Uh, and Peter Mander and Laura Carter, uh, who have both spoken to you, or well, spoken to the seminar previously, uh, are also here tonight. Um, today, we're going to concentrate on our work with teachers uh, in terms of, and I guess in terms of the project, this comes under what the ESRC would term um, sort of impact and public engagement. Um, but before handing across to Annie and Andrew to talk a bit more about this, I just want to spend 10 minutes giving you a sense of what we're trying to do, with the, with the, or try to achieve really, I suppose, with the wider project uh, and our archival research. So our aim is to write a bottom-up history of post-war secondary education in the UK from 1945 until the 1990s. Uh, the endpoint remains a little hazy uh, and changes depending upon um, what resources we're finding at a particular time, but I think it will run to the route to, to the end of the 20th century. We're considering experiences in all parts of the country, uh, in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and across all school types, state and independent, to explore how social class, gender, ethnicity, generation and locale shape the experience of schooling, and the ways in which individuals and families interacted with the state and each other around this, this field of education. We want to write a history of post-war secondary education that decenters political debates around structural change, which I think we, we feel have dominated many of the accounts to date, uh, and ask instead what the advent of mass secondary education meant for successive generations who experienced it as pupils, parents, and increasingly as both. A focus on changes within schools and the relationship to popular debates around education offer a valuable lens to understand wider changes in society. So we might think about how uh, schools let us think differently about um, the emergence of um, multi-racial, multi multi-ethnic Britain and the, the multicultural project that accompanied that, the ways in which changing gender norms uh, were experienced in schools, and again, how the experience of school uh, informed those, those changing norms and expectations, the ways in which a decline in deference again worked to reconfigure class identities and how that related into school um, spaces and contexts. Focusing on schools also allows us to think about the ways in which schools made, or, or places in which social change itself is made. Places in which young people encounter, absorb, and sometimes uh, resist the expectations about social identities of these bigger categories. Our approach has been heavily influenced by recent work that has returned to the original field notes and interview transcripts of post-war social survey material. So I'm thinking particularly here of people like John Lawrence, Florence Upcliffe Braithwaite, Selina Todd, and Claire Langhammer, to name a few, to recover the voices of that capacious and, and complex category of ordinary people, uh, which have offered new perspectives on the formation and narration of self in the post-war decades and how this changes across that period. And of course, also to the immense body of research that historians of education, several of whom are, are with us this evening, have produced uh, to help us explore the relationship between schools and social change in the late 20th century. So, in this sense, our, you can see here our key research questions uh, that have kind of shaped our, our archival research as we've gone through. And one of the key elements that has, has stood at the heart of this research then is, is rather than seeing education as a discrete phase that ends in late adolescence, we've approached it as a field of negotiation and interaction between citizens and the state and within families and communities, which mediates individual experience across the life course. And so in particular, we wanted to get away from this idea that, uh, that when you leave school, then, then education simply stops. And rather think about what, um, how it, what education means and how that meaning changes as you enter the labor market, as you make decisions as parents about your own children, 
And then in later life, also start to construct narratives um, of your own uh, life course and, and the place in which education features in them. So for this reason, we wanted to establish uh, a source base that allows us to track individual trajectories across their lives, whilst always situating these within specific historical context. And you can see here, um, this is our kind of our diagram that is helping us kind of understand what we're trying to achieve. And we've divided the, the research into, into three phases, each of which is intended to give us um, access to a different uh, scale of, of analysis. So to start with, we, we used the uh, three post-war British um, birth cohort studies, 1946, 1958, 1970, to try and get a, a national picture. And we uh, commissioned uh, J.D. Carpentieri, um, who is uh, a, part, a member of the AOE, um, to produce a sample for each from us of uh, 150 um, individuals from 46. And then we have a slightly larger samples from 58 and 70, uh, so that we can incorporate um, voices of uh, those who are arriving in Britain from um, particularly from New Commonwealth uh, territories. We're using, we're using the, uh, the cohort studies to build the pen portraits of each of our uh, participant sample uh, and to allow us to compare between generations and, with, and within generations. So I think this is particularly important for us to think about the ways in which um, we can see educational change operating both uh, between, between the, the generational uh, the shift as we, as we move through the period, but importantly actually how that's differentiated within uh, each generation experience and the conversations that initiates also between children and parents. Our second phase, we kind of we zoom in to a regional or local um, focus with six case studies, uh, which are paired with a rural and urban uh, dimension so that we have, uh, we're looking at Fife and Glasgow, for example, and think about Scotland, we're looking at Hearts and Haringey, um, think about the Southeast, um, Bristol and Somerset in the Southwest, uh, and we also have uh, case studies in, um, in the Northeast, in Wales and Northern Ireland. And we're particularly interested to use the case studies then as a way of getting inside schools, inside um, LEAs, to think about how local conditions, labour markets, demographic profiles, these processes of social change which are operating uh, in these areas across the period. And of course, shifting educational structures affected both the provision and experience of education. And we're particularly interested in the relationship between parents, pupils and schools, uh, and the LEAs, and they're interested in, in the types of um, source material that are being produced within schools that allows access to um, parent and, and um, pupil voices, and which Annie will talk a little bit more about, and to think, see how these, these voices uh, contributed to the, to the evolving debates around education. And the final phase, um, which we're on the cusp of, of starting, it's been delayed because of conditions this year, we're interested in, in particularly in, in memory. And I think our focus will fall more on social media the oral history uh, for this. And we're particularly thinking about the ways in which memories of education are curated within new social media spaces. So that how, not only how individuals um, insert their educational experience into their own life narrative, but also how that process of remembering is often a collective effort. What is remembered? How, with what sharpness uh, and emphasis in, in particular points? How does, how does ongoing group conversations about the past shape ways in which memories of school, of personalities, of individuals and of experiences um, are, are narrated in the, in the present. So from that, from that base and, and with all of our kind of the archival sources that we're, we're amassing, we wanted from the outset to think about how we might be able to make this available and usable to teachers um, and pupils who are, who are currently in school um, in, in Britain and that to ask as a way really also of asking current pupils to think sorry they've just put in new lights in my office and it's about to go dark so I have to wave my wave my arms sorry um, to, so yeah to ask to ask pupils in particular to think about how their experience of school today um, is shaped by these historical processes, how their experience relates um, to the past. And I think as a project, we've, we've all felt aware for some time that post-war British history, particularly post-war social and cultural British history, is absent from many school curriculums, um, both at key stage three and exam level. And that many of the undergraduates that we encounter um, in, in their first year 
even if they studied the period at A level, tend to arrive with an understanding grounded in the political changes of the period, um, which you kind of associated with that very traditional narrative of the post-war settlement breakdown of consensus and then the emergence of Thatcherism. But they don't really think about how that relates to deeper currents of social and cultural change that cut across this. And that we think it is it's a kind of really ideal way of approaching this is to, is to think about that through the lens of school. And interestingly, yes, the only the only students who tend to have actually studied educational change after 1945 are those who have done sociology A level rather than history. I think in the context then of, of this year, again, events of the summer have highlighted the need for a more thorough and expansive approach to teaching um, post-war uh, late 20th century British history. Um, and that the way, again, the ways in which we can use schools to ask pupils to think about changing individual experience, but also the relationship between individuals and structures is a really, um, I think, a really fruitful and, and uh, exciting way of, of, of teaching this. So with this kind of ambition in mind, we started to um, we started to think about how we might turn our research into classroom resources. We we're also aware, I think, as, as university um, based historians, we're probably not the best people to kind of tell teachers what they need and that we started off uh, started this through a process of consultation with teachers, PGC coordinators and the historical association to ask them what we needed to do and all stressed that there was a need to collaborate directly with teachers. Uh, and praise the success of, of the two projects you can see on the, the slide here, the um, women's suffrage project and then our migration story of, of how a really effective collaboration between universities and teachers can work. And that in particular, asking academics to think not what it is that they kind of, that they can deliver to schools, but rather how they can help fulfill teachers specific um, needs. So, Within that, again, they, they, they emphasise the need to have teachers as our, as our interlocutors, um, both in terms of turning the material into resources, but also then communicating that to teachers themselves. And one of the challenges that was stressed is that many teachers won't have had experience of teaching post-war British history themselves and may not have studied it either at university. And therefore, we need to have flexible resources that will allow, um, allow, that, uh, allow the, that process to um, transition from, from university research into, into the classroom. We, to do this, we've been fortunate to work with um, four teachers. Uh, Andrew's one of them, uh, Johnny Sellen, Molly Navy, and Anne Cusworth are, are the other three teachers. And that they have been a real kind of fantastic um, help to us in, in thinking about this, this uh, the ways in which we can change our change our approach, change our focus to make that more relevant uh, and usable in schools. We've been lucky enough to have some uh, additional support from um, HRC Impact Fund and the Cambridge University Admissions Office, uh, both of whom have kind of really seen the value, I think, of, of building resources that engage directly with schools and using this as a way to reach um, wider audiences with our research. And we were also incredibly fortunate to welcome Annie onto our team um, in this, well, it was intended to be in the spring, COVID delayed that and, and Annie started uh, in the late summer. And I will hand over to her now so she can talk to you more about how the, the project, the resource project itself is unfolding and we're going about making these talks. Um, Super. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to do a Chris with you here and do the next slide, please, thing, because um, we've got one screen share. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Annie Thwaite and I'm the public engagement coordinator for the project. And my main task is um, to coordinate the making of the school resource packs based on the project's work. So they kind of began when I did in August and they're going to hopefully be completed by June 2021 um, with resources available for the school year commencing next year in September 2021. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the school resource packs in relation to public engagement, why they matter, how we broach the transition between turning academic research into um, resources fit for use in schools um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the packs which we're creating now themselves in a bit more detail um, the amazing history teachers we're working with the themes of the packs what goes into them and why um, so the packs will use the project's research to focus on how school and educational experience that is sort of parent pupil teacher experience can be used as a lens to explore wider processes of social social and cultural change in Britain after 1945 so the intended audience of the PACs is key stage three pupils and teachers. Um, our aim is to make them 
academically rigorous and immediately usable in the classroom um, that and in a way that they can help academic uh, achievement and uh, aspiration. Um, we intend to make them freely available through the Historical Association and other teacher networks. And although they're going to be available to everyone, we hope that they'll be particularly valuable to teachers working in schools with kind of limited budgets for new resources. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Chris? Um, so why, why did we want to make the packs? Well, um, Chris has touched on this a bit. It's well known that it's traditionally been difficult for secondary school teachers to engage with Key Stage 3 pupils through academic research which in turn kind of leads to difficulties regarding academic outcomes and then longer term implications to do with university applications and admissions, et cetera. Um, universities are beginning to take steps to address this. And as Chris mentioned, a number of great projects out there like our migration story. Um, so we're kind of hoping to follow in their footsteps. And um, the hope we had with our school resource packs is that they address some kind of main problems that limit the ability of teachers to teach pupils using academic research. Um, one would be access to primary source material. History teachers kind of generally agree that universities maybe need to do a bit more to provide access to academic research. Um, uh, access to primary sources that can be easily used in classrooms is quite uh, uneven and limited, especially at key stage three level. And that's a particular issue for state school teachers who work under very tight budgets and time constraints. Um, so. As a result, there's a lot of variation between different schools in terms of the type of historical source materials that pupils might encounter before uh, key stage three or key stage uh, four or five. And this in turn um, has effects on pupils' abilities to develop their own core subject skills, which then impacts exams and then impacts potentially whether or not they apply to university. Um, also, the Department for Education curriculum directives and Ofsted best practice guidelines are increasingly focused on the need for pupils to engage with historiographical debates, what's often called historical interpretation at Key Stage 3. But teachers aren't often provided with the skills or contacts or resources they need to do this. So as a result, it's often left to the individual teachers to develop their own strategies, again, leading to kind of inconsistencies and variation between schools. Um, third, the Key Stage 3 curriculum places a lot of emphasis on the study of British history with a focus on local and national histories, but the focus risks potentially marginalising certain communities and groups that migrated to Britain from elsewhere and has the potential of creating a kind of insular narrative. Um, so teachers need resources that let them explore the diversity of experience in Britain after the Second World War. Um, and finally, at the moment, and Chris touched on this a second ago, secondary education and the fact that secondary education became an essentially universal experience for 11 year olds in Britain after the Second World War is not really taught in schools or used to engage current secondary school pupils when they study British history after 1945. It's um, been talked about by history teachers like Michael Fordham, um, who've um, spotlighted the kind of growing concern over the lack of post Second World War British history being taught in secondary schools. So our school resource packs hope to go a way to pre prevent presenting a creative narrative to these kind of omissions. Our hope is that by addressing these kind of issues, teachers might more easily be able to teach academic research, engage pupils and have impact on longer term things like further education. We also hope that this public engagement activity will help build collaborative links between current history teachers and the Faculty of History in Cambridge. Um, we were literally, literally hoping to trial the PACs early next year at four local maintained schools which participate in a Cambridge widening participation programme, but um, we're kind of thinking about how we can maybe rearrange those plans a little in line with the effects of the pandemic and access to schools and access to our own archives. Um, but at some point we hope to go into schools, um, do some workshops, get some feedback from pupils and teachers who've used the packs in those workshops um, and then eventually monitor evaluation through downloads um, and teacher feedback forms on, on websites like the Historical Association. Um, so Chris, if you could just change the slide, please. Um, how do we hope to do all this and what is inside the packs? So um, 
We're going to have four packs, each covering a different theme, but all united by the same main research question, which will be, in what ways do schools reflect social change in the UK since 1945? The themes covered by each pack are race and ethnicity, class and social mobility, gender and sexuality, and everyday school life. Um, each resource pack will also aim to incorporate religion and the SCN experience in some way too. Um, they'll each contain material for a historical inquiry, six lessons in length, and contain a kind of rich mix of primary source material, both textual and visual. Things like um, school logbooks, inspectors reports, oral histories, blueprints of schools, um, school magazine clippings, newspaper reports, things like this. Um, we're also going to include interpretive videos from university-based historians who are currently working on post-1945 British history to discuss how they approach source analysis in their work with reference to a specific source that will be included in the video. And the hope is that these will provide rigorous introduction to historical debate and insight into how this operates within universities and give people a bit of an insight into that. The packs will also include lesson plans, which are intended to help pupils develop their core subject skills and their depth of knowledge. Um, our project's research offers new insight into how race and gender shaped educational experience. So it's hoped the resource packs will sensitively introduce a more nuanced picture to what is um, sometimes found in some key stage three textbooks, um, which often focus exclusively on the post Windrush immigration. Um, and by doing this, we're hoping that maybe more BME pupils will become interested in studying history university level. Um, the packs will also offer focus on the relationship between local and national histories. Each pack will include a local case study and also a guide for teachers about how to access their local archives if say they want to use their own school or a school in their own area um, as an example alongside the material in the packs. Um, our aim is to make the packs as adaptable as possible so that teachers can use the content to fit fewer lessons if necessary fewer than six if they don't have time for that or if they want to mix and match between the different packs and pick out elements of, of each. Um, whilst they're aimed at key stage three we're hoping that they have the potential of being adapted for older pupils um, maybe GCSE or A level two so that they can use the material if they need to. A very important part of making this work was working collaboratively with our teachers. Um, so as Chris mentioned, since August, we've been working with four great secondary school history teachers acting as our consultants, including Andrew, who's here with us today and going to tell us a bit more about his source back in particular. But before he does, I was just going to go into a bit more detail about what is in each source pack and how they're being structured. So Chris, if you could change the slide, please. Um, Molly Ann Navy, who is a history teacher at the Priory School in Lewis in East Sussex, is examining changing experiences of and attitudes to gender and sexuality through the lens of secondary education. She's formulating a lesson plan based loosely around source material and then methodological issues arising from the sources. So over the course of the six lessons, she's hoping that students will reflect on the different experiences of male and female pupils, but also staff members. Um, she's going to include primary sources that reveal attitudes to gender and sexuality and how these attitudes changed from 1945 to now. She's providing a local study of her own school, the Priory School in Lewis, um, at which there was a big debate over gender neutral school uniform last September 2019. You might have seen it on the news and I've just clipped the BBC News article there on the slide. Um, she also hopes to use sources like floor plans, evidencing uh, changing school layouts, statistical evidence regarding careers and the destinations of male and female school leavers, excerpts from school magazines where pupils talk about their own gendered experiences, and of course the formative children's book Jenny Lives with Erica Martin and the reception that received and why that was important. Um, next slide please Chris. So Hannah Cusworth, who is a teacher at the Charter School in East Dulwich, is using the inquiry question, in what ways do schools reflect changing attitudes towards race in the UK since 1945, as a framework for her pack on race and ethnicity. She hopes to plan lessons which will cover topics including busing, community activism and religious and faith school expansion. Her lesson plan is loosely chronological, but also she's hoping to use 
change over time concepts to guide her lessons. So she's kind of structured them according to the concepts of assimilate, assimilation to realization, to conflict, to toleration, to change. Uh, she's considering a local study either on Bradford or London and her sources are going to include things like photos and leaflets from anti-racism campaigns, photos of National Front meetings in the classroom, uh, oral histories of former students and their experiences with racism, the appendices of the 1985 Swan report, things like this. Uh, next slide please Chris. Um, so Johnny Stellan, who's a teacher at Bottisham Village College, is working on everyday school life. Johnny acknowledged that this was a really broad topic and was kind of challenging to thematically bring together a very wide range of topics that could have been encompassed in this pack. He was quite keen to avoid the fun facts approach that everyday school life might have um, and was aware that it was the pack that might be chopped and changed the most. So I wanted to be flexible but rigorous in his plan um, and wanted to plan his contextual knowledge carefully. He discussed the pros and cons of using either change or continuity like some of the other teachers have done as opposed to evidential thinking as the conceptual driver of his school resource pack and he is erring towards um, evidential thinking as the way he's going to go with his. He hopes to focus on topics ranging from curriculum to corporal punishment to homework and exams, school trips and his sources will include things like inspectors reports to do with school architecture, school dinner, discipline, photos and examples of school dinners and menus, um, school magazine clippings where people talk about things like homework and punishment and newspaper reports of designs of new school buildings, say in post-war brutalism style or newspapers reporting on the reception of TV dramas like Grange Hill that focus on schools. Um, and Chris, next slide, please. And finally, um, Andrew is uh, here with us today and he's picked up the word reflect as key to formulating his resource pack on class and social mobility using the question, are schools a reflection of social change or a driver of social change to anchor his work? I'm not gonna to say too much about it before I hand over to him, but he's aiming to make lesson plans which track uh, changes in policy and trends in social mobility with a local study of his own school. He's hoping to make use of school logbook entries, recording school closures and mergers, as well as birth cohort data where participants were asked about their perceptions of, perceptions of class and newspaper clippings, things like um, the one I've got on the screen here, which is where James Callahan visited a Welsh comprehensive. Um, so, yep, I think I'll hand over to Andrew now to tell us a bit more about his pack and his experiences with um, working on the school resource packs. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chris, could you just um, end your screen share so I can do mine, please? Thank you. Hi everyone, um, and thanks for the um, invitation to speak to you. Um, as was mentioned at the start, I'm Andrew Stacey Chapman, um, and I'm the Head of Humanities at North Allerton School and Sixth Form College in North Yorkshire, which is um, an 11 to 18 comprehensive school um, with a fascinating history of its own, really. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a kind of introduction to my school resource pack in a bit more detail um, to illustrate some of what Chris and Annie have been saying. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how I found the process as, a, as one of the teacher consultants and in particular some of the challenges I've found in turning this kind of research into a unit of work for year nine students. So as we talk, as has been uh, sort of mentioned already, in our initial meeting between the historians and the um, teacher consultants, we worked together to hammer out an overarching inquiry question that would sit over the top of all the units of study we were going to plan. Now this is a vital part of any history teacher's medium term planning, deciding on a rigorous historical question that students will work towards an answer for. So we agreed on this question that you've already seen. In what ways do schools reflect societal change in the United Kingdom since 1945? Now, because the theme for my school resource pack is class and social mobility, as I thought about the theme in the context of the inquiry question, and particularly as I, as I began to read, um, I increasingly wanted to hone in on this word reflect. So in other words, my resource pack 
is in part an exploration of how far school how far schools have been drivers of social mobility, as policymakers tend to hope for and trumpet, um, and how far schools have simply reflected back broader trends in class and social mobility since 1945. And so this has led me to a sequence of seven lessons, including two introductory lessons, the content of which is, is on the screen there. Um, some of the lessons will include opportunities for local studies where they're relevant, um, and I'll be planning a local study on my own school, which used to be a grammar school and then became a comprehensive in the 1970s. I don't intend to talk in detail through um, the finer detail of each of those lessons, um, but of course, if people want more information, I can answer questions about the content of those lessons in due course. So, some reflections on making the school resource pack. Um, firstly, it's been it's been absolutely amazing to work with this group of academic historians on their current work. Um, as an insight for me into the way that a group of historians do their work, I've really valued it. Um, previous collaboration I've had with historians. Um, since graduation and becoming a teacher um, has been a lot more ad hoc, um, mainly me badgering historians I was taught by for specific guidance on some up-to-date reading. Um, and it's, so it's really great to be working with a team of historians on their current research. But one of the striking things about this project for me is that my non-specialism has hit me in a way that it hasn't since the first year or two of my teaching career. Um, I'm really an early modernist um, with a bit of early America thrown in. Now, early in a school history teaching career, non-specialism is very much the norm. With a curriculum that generally spans from the Roman Empire to the Cold War, with, as has been mentioned, a noticeable absence of modern social history, um, most history teachers begin their careers with specialism in somewhere probably between about 10 and 20 percent of the curriculum that they're teaching. And that process of becoming more specialist in a broader range of the curriculum is a long and slow one, but it's normally aided by a great deal of published resources specifically aimed at key stages three to five. And so as teachers, we're therefore able to start with poor school textbooks um, and gradually add to that with more detailed academic texts and contemporary material. This project, meanwhile, has been significantly more start to finish in curriculum planning than we're generally used to in schools. So making this school resource pack has really been a kind of start to finish planning process from swatting up on class, social mobility and education, um, background reading, contemporary sources, and only then moving into the process of medium term planning and lesson planning. It's For me, it's been reminiscent of having eight weeks to master early modern social and economic history in the first year of my degree. Um, so as the sort of memory of my undergraduate days fades away, this process has been quite invigorating. And finally, the um, doing this kind of start to finish planning has helped with other, with curriculum development more broadly in my own department. Um, so as we've reflected on our, on this sort of modern social history unit, we've also then reflected on social history more broadly in our curriculum. And it's led us to create an early modern social history unit from scratch, going back to the scholarship, to develop an inquiry into the social order, literacy, gender, and credit in early modern England. And so some of the challenges. Um, there are three challenges that I found in particular working on my school resource pack on class and, and um, social mobility. Now, there are always some challenges when we're using academic history in the classroom in a way as direct as this. It's become much more common in recent years to use increasingly substantial extracts of historical scholarship in the classroom, with students encountering and engaging with academic texts that have not been altered for classroom use. Consider this extract from a much longer one we use in the classroom with year nine students, uh, which is taken from Margaret Macmillan's The War of Attended Peace. We use it, obviously, as part of our, inqu our inquiry into the causes of the First World War. And this extract helps students to recognize the unpredictability of the outbreak of war for contemporaries. You'll already be able to see some of the potential barriers to using work such as this in the Key Stage 3 classroom. Notably, that works of academic history are written for readers better informed about the broader historical context and with better vocabulary than most 14-year-olds have. 
Yet work by history teacher researchers like Rachel Foster and others over the past 10 years has provided both inspiration to use academic history in the classroom and solutions to some of the challenges this poses. But this leads on to the second challenge I found in working on my school resource pack, that much of the language of modern social history and sociology is more specialist than that found in other areas of the historical discipline. And both the evidential base and historians' arguments in this field are by nature incredibly nuanced and complex. So let's return for a moment to the extract from Margaret Macmillan. There's language highlighted in here that requires prior knowledge of political and diplomatic structures to be understood fully. Yet Macmillan's central argument here is relatively comprehensible regardless of students' understanding of that language. And half a lesson of reading the text aloud while students draw out words relating to people being happy or unafraid, which are in red, will quickly allow students to access Macmillan's work. And all students in a mixed ability year nine class would be able to do that in about 20 minutes or half an hour. Now let's compare this to an extract from Peter's book on the crisis of the meritocracy, a book which by the way, I think is incredibly clear and there's genuinely converted an early modern constitutional historian like me to um, being fascinated by modern social history. This extract presents an argument that will be central to my school resource pack on education, class and social mobility. Namely that the expansion of secondary education in the mid 20th century did not bring about significant increases in social mobility. And yet even in its clearest form as Peter presents it, using this as part of an extract in the classroom is very challenging. Even if we take for granted the statistical fluency required to appreciate the evidence here, the language of social history and the necessarily detailed nature of its evidence base makes using academic history in the classroom a real challenge. And I've just highlighted there some of, the, some of the language that kind of comes through in this literature that I think students would find more challenging than they might find um, elsewhere in their history lessons. Now, this is partly overcome by the historian's videos that Annie mentioned that are being created that explore some of these themes about class and social uh, mobility. But as I work on the school resource pack, I find myself torn between my instinct to use challenging, ambitious and real historical scholarship in the year nine classroom. And my fear that this might not be as accessible to students as a text on the history of politics or international relations. And for the final challenge I'd like to present, is that of how the history of class in the late 20th century might be perceived by groups of 13 or 14 year olds. The language of class structures and social mobility is almost entirely hierarchical. We talk of upward mobility of class one, class two and class three. This language has a shared meaning among social historians who though they may see its derogatory potential, nevertheless employ it as a shorthand for complex social phenomena. Similarly, as we examine contemporary sources on educational policy, we read of schools as offering ladders of opportunity or the broad highway from one set of life experiences to another. Not being a modern social historian, I don't come here to critique that use of language. But it does present a significant challenge as I work to teach these phenomena to young teenagers. As part of this school resource pack, I think students need to learn about the seven class scale, the OED triangle, and certainly understandings of upward social mobility. But our classrooms are thankfully filled with students from all backgrounds. And the obvious discussions that will arise in classrooms will be about what different students' parents do and where that places them in these hierarchies. One of the first things you learn as a classroom teacher is that what you say and what students hear are rarely the same thing. So where I might briefly outline the seven class scale students might hear, I'm better than your parents because I'm a professional. And where I might present the OED triangle, students might hear, let's hope you can escape your origins and get somewhere in life. This challenge of the perceptions of class among school students in some ways gets to the heart of the relationship between the history of education and education itself. And it's the problem of the three I presented that I'm the least close to solving. At the moment, my best solution is to create a somewhat artificial barrier between past and present, and simply to present these structures and phenomena as things of the past, knowing that students rarely become offended when we teach medieval feudalism, for example. 
but this feels historically risky and any suggestions on that challenge would be most welcome. And so although I've concluded with the challenges of the work, I'd just like to reiterate the, the sheer joy of work that working on this project has been. Um, and I can't wait to begin teaching students using the work of all the history teacher consultants and to keep alive the kind of energizing dialogue um, we've established with those working in academic history. Thank you.